Gotcha games have been around for about a decade, and there have been hundreds of games in all different variants, based around anime, video games, or even making up all new stories that often rely on the aesthetic of the game to attract new players. Oh, and also anime girls. Lots and lots of anime girls. Now, I'm going to explain some of the basics of gotchas, so that everyone, even those not really into these types of games, can understand what I'm talking about, so bear with me. Often, gotcha games have their own ways to differentiate themselves from others. Some are slower and more strategic, while others are faster and full of real-time action. They can be calm and relaxing, where you can start a stage and complete it in two hours later, or it can be full of adrenaline like PvP-based ones. To put it simply, there really is a type of gotcha for everyone. And as different as they might be from one another, there are always two main core mechanics that are consistent in every game. Summoning, or pulling if you're more familiar with that term, and power creep. Summons are quite literally the very foundation of gotchas. Just think of the name, derived from gotcha pones, machines of Japanese origins where by paying a small sum of money, you get back a random prize, usually a small figure or toy. It doesn't take much to see the correlation between these two things. You pay a sum of money or game currency to get back a character most of the time, or in other cases, an armament to further power up your team. And it's right here that the second factor that unites all gotchas comes into play, power creep. To put it shortly, power creep is the gradual increase of power that the newly released characters get put through with the passage of time. Think of it like a Cartesian plane, where the x-axis is the elapsed time since the game releases, and the y-axis is the strength of the new units, which makes sense, right? If all the new characters were as strong as the ones released two years prior, there wouldn't really be much incentive to pull. And if the players don't pull on new banners, that also means they don't buy game currency with real money, which then means that the developers don't get any money and the game ultimately ends up shutting down. Power creep is the lifeblood of gotchas, and without it, the whole genre just wouldn't exist. But what happens when power creep is badly managed? I mean, if the developers need to make players pull for their new characters, why not make them sharply better than the previous ones? And the reason is very simple, actually. It's because players have a finite amount of currency to spend. So if someone spends all of his or her free-to-play savings on X unit, just to then see Y unit come out two weeks later and completely declass X unit, they might be willing to drop some cash to try and obtain the new unit. But what happens if shortly after Y unit releases, it also gets power crept? And if the unit that power crept Y also gets power crept after a short period of time, the aforementioned player could end up quitting the game entirely. And then obviously, a non-playing player is also a non-paying player. So that affects the bottom line of the company. But this also begs the question, wouldn't the simple solution be to then just make every new character marginally better than the previous one? And unfortunately, no, it isn't. In fact, you end up with the inverse problem, which is that after getting a certain character, the players have no real reason to pull for the next ones, and as such, start accumulating game currency, which will then be used after god only knows how many months, because Power Creep finally made the new character strong enough to make a real difference over the old ones. And as such, we just go back to the previous point, where developers don't get enough money, and yada yada yada, the system continues. In conclusion, developers have to find the sweet spot that makes new characters better than the previous ones, but not to the point of making them feel almost mandatory or borderline redundant because of how similar in power they are. It's an extremely delicate subject, and it's about this that I want to talk about in this video. Remember the gradual power increase I mentioned earlier? I'll talk in more detail about that here. So what happens when a game with a stable and balanced power creep releases a character that is drastically stronger than the previous ones? In this case, we have a phenomenon called power spike, where the new character is so strong that it ignores the usual power creep of the game. To return to the earlier Cartesian plane analogy, imagine a 45 degree line that at a certain point, instead of continuing with its linear path, rises for a very short time and then falls again immediately after. That is a power spike, and usually there are two types of it, meta-breaking spikes and game-breaking spikes. Let's start in order and talk about the first variant. A meta-breaking spike usually happens when the new character is strong enough to create an entirely new meta around him or his team without making all other characters totally obsolete. It's clear that they are cut above the rest, but not to the point of making everyone else look like ants when compared to them. An example could be the original Super Saiyan 4 as released during the second anniversary of Dokkan. Their kits were definitely out of the box for when they released, and their leader skills completely changed the meta. Their release, however, didn't make all other characters on their teams or even every other character in the game in general seem irrelevant or nigh useless when compared to them. Now let's talk about game-breaking spikes. That is when the newly released unit is so strong that it's considered a real one-man army, making everyone else that came before them completely useless. For this case, I'm going to give three examples. One for a single-player PvE game, one for a multiplayer PvE game, and one for a PvP-based game, so that I can cover and allow you to understand what happens in each of the three styles of gotchas when a game-breaking character is released. 
The three examples I'll use are STR Gogeta from the first anniversary of Dokkan for the single player PvE gacha, Gala Cleo from Dragalia Lost for the PvE multiplayer gacha, and Purple Broly from Dragon Ball Legends for the PvP based gacha. I'll try to explain to the best of my abilities each of these three situations so that even those who are not that knowledgeable in each of the games can fully understand what I'm talking about. Let's start with the first case, STR Gogeta. In Dokkan, one of the most important mechanics when it comes to team building are leader skills. Based on the leader skill being used, the characters in your team will get various stat boosts that are weaker or stronger depending on the leader skill of the team. Up until the first anniversary, there were monotype leader skills, that is a leader skill that buffed only one typing out of the five different types present in the game for 3 key and 3000 attack. This made it so team building required much more effort from the player, since to make a team, they could only use a fifth of the characters available in the game. Possibly even more divided if the players didn't have all the characters currently out in the game available to them. Otherwise, you could use universal leader skills, which however didn't give any stat boost other than key, making the team potentially better since you had a much bigger choice of characters to use, but also weaker at the same time since they didn't give any offensive stat boosts from the leader skill. All of this, however, changed with the release of STR Gogeta, which not only had a universal 3 key leader skill, but also boosted the attack by 3000, much like the monotype leaders, making them in all respects completely obsolete. Furthermore, his damage output was the highest in the game by a huge margin, making every other endgame content released up until then drastically easier, and he dominated the game for 6 months up until the 1.5 year anniversary. Gogeta was so strong that it was advised to throw away your current account if you didn't manage to pull him just to get a brand new one with him on it. Fortunately though, Dokkan is a PvE single player game, so the release of a game breaking character like Gogeta doesn't really impact the overall experience of a player or the game progression as a gacha. Let's move on to the second case now, that of Gala Cleo. First and foremost, however, I will explain what a Gala character is so you guys can fully grasp the situation. Gala banners and Dragalia are special summons that came out once every two months and have a specific set of characters that were pullable only in those said banners. Every Gala banner had a rate up Gala character with 0.5% rate to be found meanwhile the rest of the Gala characters are in the unfeatured unit pool with the rest of the 5 stars, making them incredibly difficult to get, which means that if you didn't manage to pull whoever was in the rate up at the time, your chances of finding them later on dropped drastically. Now that I've explained what Gala units are and how the banners are structured, we can move on and talk about Gala Cleo and why her sole existence hurt the metagame for various months. The easiest way to put it is that she did everything. And I don't say this as a way to exaggerate the situation. She seriously did everything, and she was darn good at it too. She healed her team, debuffed the enemy, buffed her ally's strength, and as if that wasn't enough, she had such high DPS that the second strongest DPS at the time barely reached 60% of her output. And to put even more salt into the wound, in single player you can only use a single copy of each character. Meanwhile, multiplayer doesn't have this limitation. Meaning that in every shadow event that Gala Cleo was usable in, using a team comp of 4 Cleos was by far the best strategy available, essentially killing every other team variation making the meta extremely monotonous. And those who didn't manage to pull Cleo had it extremely rough, since as I said earlier, there was a Gala every 2 months and after a character had their initial raid up banner, they went into the unfeatured pool, making chasing Cleo practically impossible. Not only that, but finding a multiplayer room became extremely difficult for those without Cleos, as using the aforementioned strat was both faster and easier by a long shot. And in a game where you have to farm the same endgame event tens of times, it was also understandable as to why this happened. To be honest, those without her got bullied in the lobbies using the in-game sticker function, and I wish I was joking. This created a disparity between those with Cleo and those without her. One side of the player base was farming events at mock speed with relative ease. Meanwhile, the rest of the players had issues even finding a room that would accept them, let alone complete set events. To recap everything, if you didn't manage to pull Cleo, you had various months of near unbeatable shadow content. This was clearly a huge issue and since they couldn't just nerf her, the development team did the next best thing and raised the bar for new shadow characters until all new ones were more or less on her power level. This obviously made shadow the best typing in the game, but thankfully it didn't become so strong that it started invading content of other elements, finding a good if slightly messed up point of balance for the game. Overall, Cleo was a quite a huge issue for Dragalia, but by being a strictly PvE game, it managed to not have too big of a bad impact on the player experience, even though it created a bit of a division in the community for a few months. 
Now we can move on to the third case, and in my opinion, also the worst one, with it being Purple Broly in Dragon Ball Legends. And if you're wondering why I think it's the worst one, it's simply because Legends, unlike the other two games, is based on PvP. Which means that if a character that is overly strong gets released that ruins the entire metagame for who knows how long, demoralizes the players that go into PvP just to find themselves against the same team over and over, and it also considerably lowers the skill ceiling of the game, making players rely more on the strength of the characters rather than on their own skill. Before Broly came out, there were mainly three meta teams at the time. Saiyans, Hybrid Saiyans, and Regeneration. And it was an overall pretty balanced and diversified meta, with some teams like Super Saiyans and Lineage of Evil also being used, although not as much as the first three. All of this, however, became a distant memory when Broly released, making Super Saiyan the best team in the game by far, and thus making everyone else seem so weak to the point of being irrelevant. There were mainly three reasons for this. First being that Broly, thanks to one of his passive abilities, ignored type disadvantage for a short period of time effectively eliminating his natural counters for about 15 seconds every time he enters the field, which in a game like Legends is a lot of time. The kicker though is that he could do this up to 4 times for a total of up to 60 counts. For context, Legends matches have a total time limit of 180 counts, so for up to a third of the game, Broly had nothing to hard counter him. The second reason was his absurdly high stats, which made Broly a monstrously pure tank and DPS in a meta that had very few buffs both offensively and defensively. And if that wasn't enough, he also healed 20% of his health on transformation, making up for his lower stats in his base form. The third and probably most important reason is the existence of Super Saiyan Bardock, which allowed his Super Saiyan allies to exponentially deal more damage by giving them a massive buff to both their critical rate and critical damage. This made Broly an unstoppable war machine that could defeat enemies from full health in one single combo, and since he had this type nullification passive, this could happen to practically any unit in the game. The game transformed into a, you either have Broly, or you don't get to play, fest for various months, creating the most monotonous meta the game ever saw, since Super Saiyans was the only really viable team at the time, and there wasn't a single tag at the time that could even dream to keep up with them both offensively or defensively. This is for sure the worst type of power spike that there is, considering that it makes the mode the whole game is based around almost unplayable for those that don't have the character, and those who did manage to get him experienced the much more boring and repetitive experience having to fight the same teams time and time again. As I hope you were able to understand from this video, power creep is a very delicate mechanic to manage, as even a single misstep could ruin the state of the game for months and months for who knows how many other people or in the worst cases, bring a game to a complete close and get it shut down if the developers mess up that badly. Hey guys, I'm Soda. I'm one of the editors for 59 Gaming, but this time around I had a bit of a different role since, if you guys didn't notice, this is the first ever scripted video we've ever done on this channel, to try and raise the bar for quality. This video alone took me over 30 hours of work to complete, between doing the research, scripting, editing and so on and I'm really, really happy with the final result. And now I want to ask you guys if you liked the video and want to see us do more of this analysis style and let us know in the comments what we should improve on to make them the best they can possibly be. Having said that, I really hope you enjoyed the video and I will see you in the next one. See ya!